My name is John Sylvester. I'm Australia's longest serving crime reporter and write a weekly column for The Age. Many of my colleagues have wondered why I've never bothered to move to other areas of the paper. The reason's pretty simple. I've got the best job in journalism, playing cops and robbers and getting paid for it. Over more than 40 years, I've covered some of Australia's biggest crimes and met fascinating characters on both sides of the law. In this series, you'll hear from them, the cops and the crooks, telling their stories. Welcome to my world. Welcome to Naked City. What makes a hero? Most of the time, it's a spur-of-the-moment reaction when a surge of adrenaline sparks deep hidden instincts. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Here is Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill. They call it the flight-or-fight response, a split-second reaction to a confrontation with danger. Sergeant David Key was always more calculated, for on most days of his working life, he knew he might have to risk his to save someone else's. So, which means the waves were coming at 90 feet, and it was just incredible. There's nothing in the law that says a police officer must risk death to do the job. If a gunman starts firing, cops are entitled to hide rather than become targets. Key's career was not about taking on gunmen. It was way more dangerous than that. With homes literally exploding in flames, drastic measures were required to help many people escape their properties. Since 1988, his main job was to dangle from a bucking helicopter at the end of a wire. No thicker than a drinking straw to rescue people who had just run out of options. I couldn't believe that they'd got on that wire and come into those conditions just to save some people that he'd never met before. It was pretty amazing. David Key is unassuming and always turns away from praise. Sometimes when you rescue people, I say, oh, how can we ever thank you? I say, I like chocolate cake. (laughs) By the time Key came to policing, he already had an intimate knowledge of danger, having served in the army from 1973 until 84, working as a leopard tank commander. Okay, you're going to be a general duties police officer, so what possessed you to decide? No, I don't want to do that. I want to hang out of an open helicopter on a piece of string as thick as a drinking straw. Where, you know, was this um, too much alcohol or what, what, <laughs> what on earth made you decide to do that? Yeah. It's resist me to do that. Well, because uh, during my time in the army, I'd done um, exercises and different things in helicopters, and I thought, you know, that was just a complete different exhilaration to running around in a tank. Mm. And when I joined the police force, I intended to be general duties. And then a vacancy came up um, with the police air wing. So I thought, oh, I'll give that a go. Out of the 800 rescue missions, he'd been on the end of that thin metal wire about 400 times and been the winch operator on about the same number of operations. No one needs to be rescued on a lovely sunny day in the middle of a football oval. It's always pouring with rain, snow, fog, wind, all sorts of things, dark. In uh, sort of the land side of the rescues, mainly bushwalkers, campers, kayakers that in, got themselves lost or in difficulty. And in the ocean side of it, in the bay, it was mainly fishermen that had been washed overboard or off yachts. And of course, then the, the city to Hobart. That's 1998, the famous one. Yeah. In those 400 missions dangling at the end of the line, there are two that stand out the 1998 City to Hobart yacht race and the inferno that was the 2009 Black Saturday bushfires. The worst conditions in the Sydney to Hobart's history turned the race for line honours into one for survival. Two are confirmed dead, a third feared drowned and an entire crew of nine is still missing. It was the day after Boxing Day in 1998 when the crew of the ageing police Dauphine twin-engine Air 491 helicopter received a call of multiple emergency beacons in Bass Strait. Five yachts in the Sydney to Hobart race had sent mayday signals and two were reported sinking. Uh, we are about to knock off and then we got a call from OSSA, Australian Search and Rescue in Camp, who we uh, uh, operate under them. There's a problem. And they said, oh, would you mind popping out into Bass Strait? We've got an emergency beacon going off. We said, yeah, no problems, we'll go and do that. 
And as we took off, we just had our normal rescue equipment on us, nothing special. David and the crew had no idea that this was going to be one of their most dangerous rescue missions. The police helicopter was not a new machine by then. It was quite... No, it was a very old one. Yeah, very old and one. so what speed um, should it have been going and what speed was it going? OK, it should have been doing 240 kilometres an hour. Uh, we were doing 420. So you had a 160 kilometre tailwind. Tailwind. Yeah, OK. <laughs> the first call was to the Winston Churchill. Mayday, mayday, mayday. As we're heading towards that, they said, no, there's men being washed overboard off Kingara. Uh, you can head towards that. Again, you got the tailwind? Uh, very big tailwind, yes. So you smash your way out there? Yes, yes. And <clears throat> we uh, we come across the, the vessel, and it's pretty to bear as the, the skipper, and they're all pointing to the back of the, out the back of the boat. Seattle resident John Campbell was no deep water novice. He'd crewed in two previous Sydney to Hobarts. Both times, the yachts had to retire through gear failure. This time, he was on board the heavy weather specialist Kingara when it was swamped by a giant wave and rolled before righting itself. Campbell was knocked out and washed away. Attached by a lifeline, but temporarily lifeless, he slipped out of his harness. He was swept away wearing only a T-shirt, blue long johns and with no life jacket. The crew of Air 491 was Daryl Jones as the pilot, Barry Barclay as the winch operator, with David to be on the wire. The three had worked together many times. They knew each other well, and they would need every bit of their experience in this hell hole. So as we came round the front of the boat, they were all sort of waving and then pointing. The wind caught us and just threw us backwards about a good kilometre. It really hit the side of the helicopter. And uh, Daryl Jones was the pilot. And he collected the aircraft, stabilised it. And the winch uh, operator was Barry Barclay, leant out the side and spotted the fella in the water. Fluke. Maybe it was luck. Maybe it was skill. Maybe it was a combination of both. But they found him. We're 120 k's offshore. No. <laughs> In a, needle in, the in a cyclone. Yeah. In the cyclone, Key was winched down from the helicopter. Now the waves. The waves. OK. Barry kept us over the top of the fellow that was in the water. Uh, he wasn't waving or anything, it was just bobbing around. I went out and the wind caught me and pushed me backwards. So I'm looking up at the tail of the helicopter, not the middle. So you're like, almost like a kite at the back. Actually, I'm just straight out the back. When Key was winched into the near freezing sea, he was hit by a 25 metre wave the size of a six storey building, whipped up by the 160 kilometre winds. This wasn't a rolling swell, but angry, irrational waves that came from any direction. Powerful enough to crush an ocean going yacht, let alone a policeman hanging by a thread. The helicopter above dragged him along the surface of three waves the size of small hills. Because the remaining crew, Daryl Jones and Barry Barclay, could see their target in the water, they tried to hover about 30 metres above Campbell, but the rogue waves meant they had to power up to stop being swallowed by the giant seas that peaked just two metres under the helicopter. The, the waves, um, my recollection of the waves, were as big as a six-storey building. Uh, 90 feet. Wow. Key was blown off course and was carrying 15 kilos of rescue gear so he had no chance of swimming to Campbell. Instead, they dragged him in like a fishing lure, 100 metres to Campbell, who was just minutes from death. Imagine if you're in a cyclone and then you're pulled into a wave, it's just black and dead quiet. It's a real funny feeling. And then popped out the back of that, fell down, and just looked up and there's another one, huge one, just like a surf breaker. And I uh, got dragged through that. And at that stage, then I thought, I'm just about to run out of air. Um, I was about to pop my life jacket and set off my emergency beacon. And then I popped out the back of that wave and uh, just about off 10 feet away, there's the fella. John Campbell was one of the luckiest men on earth. It was like finding a needle in a haystack. If the haystack was inside a giant washing machine. So you get to this guy. Yep. Um, is he conscious? What's he doing? 
semi-conscious, and I think that's what saved him as well. He was just about gone. When I grabbed him, it was just like feeling a, an eel. He was just cold, clammy, and sort of slippery, because all he had on was um, some long johns. No other yachting equipment. That had all just been washed off. Yeah. And his face was very badly smashed in. I found out later it hit the compass on the boat as it rolled. Because mm. and... the boat capsized? Yes. He was thrown out? He was thrown overboard. With some difficulty, Key got Campbell into the harness. So you get him? Got him, uh, put the harness on him, and we couldn't talk because we just get him tumbled like a, like a rag doll. And uh, I quickly gave the signal. I still couldn't see the helicopter. I hadn't heard it, uh, hoping I was still attached. Uh, and then next second I felt the wire tighten and we started to get dragged up. But we're about probably 10 feet from the helicopter and the winch froze. Again, I uh, don't need this, because <laughs> um, we were just hanging out. And we discussed that, that if it did freeze, they were going to fly around to the front of the yacht and then cut us off. And hopefully we'd make it to the yacht. So I'm sort of hanging, hanging there, hanging there. And of course, I'm fairly weak at this stage as well, so I'm bear hugging this poor fella. And he's just looking at me uh, in the face. And next second, the winch. Um, gained a bit of power and stopped again, but Barry was able to reach down and drag him into the helicopter. John Campbell, who'd been limp and near death, suddenly sprang back to life. And then he bent down, power came back on again, and I flew in through that door. I just wanted, wanted to get inside. So you would have thought you're pretty safe by now? Yes, well, we did. We thought that. But in the 160-kilometre headwind, the helicopter was moving at just 40 kilometres an hour and swallowing one litre of fuel every 10 seconds. They were 32 kilometres from shore when the five-minute fuel alarm activated and the crew prepared to ditch. Jones, the pilot, knew the craft was about to run out of fuel and crash and he wanted everyone but him to jump to save their lives. He was going to move forward and ditch the helicopter. And in those where the sea conditions, uh, you know, he probably knew, as we did as well, that he wouldn't have been able to get out. <laughs> because when it hits the water, it then turns and the blades smash all over the place. Jones himself would have expected to die. Um, yeah, his chances were, were very slim. But as we discussed it, discussion, because you know, we all have to be in agreement with it. So yes, 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 yes. As soon as someone says no for something, uh, like doing a rescue or whatever, that's it. It's, that's where it stops. Uh, but we'd all said yes three times and we were just edging our way to the door and we came to the edge of the, the cyclone and next second, woof. Just as the three-minute fuel warning sounded, the wind died down because they were close to shore and out of the storm. We just took off, absolutely took off. Couldn't believe it. And uh, we saw Gabo Island. We said, oh, we'll, we'll try and make it to the beach at Malakuta and we'll just put it on the beach. Nursing the craft, Jones landed Air 491 on the footy oval. Which was full of kids because it was Christmas. And we just came in and just cleared the kids very quickly and just put it down. The three of us got out and we're just sort of looking at each other going, you know, what did we just do? And on the inside, on the window, was poor John Campbell tapping on the window. <laughs> I cannot get out now. <laughs> And we, at that stage, we didn't even know his name. Yeah. The ambulance came, loaded him into it, and, and off he went. Rather than count their blessings, Key and the crew were back into action. And the next day rescued four sailors from the Midnight Special, a craft that also sailed in the Sydney to Hobart. The last plucked from the sea as the yacht sank. The uh, Midnight Special from Queensland. Uh, the, there was, I think, nine on it all up. Uh, one other helicopter had got the first... Uh, four or five off, and we were to get the rest off. Uh, but when we, we found it and flew into it, the swell was about 70 feet. A swell is a lot better than vertical waves. And we looked in the water, and there was a lot of sail and ropes in the water, and it was probably a bit too dangerous for me to go onto the yacht to get them. So the idea was for me to go about probably 50, 60 feet behind it, get dropped into the water, and then beckon them in on the top of a wave, so they'd come down the wave to me, I'd grab them and winch them up. And that worked perfectly for the first three. 
Uh, then I was getting very tired. I was starting to vomit up salt water. And I said to the third bloke, I said, oh, I've just got to have a rest for a second. And Daryl said, no, I've got to move because I'm still fighting the wind and he was cramping. So we took off through the sea mist and we found out later that the skipper was still on the boat, thought that was it, he was being left behind. So I went back down to the water and we just couldn't, he wasn't looking at me or paying attention. And then all of a sudden he sort of shook his head and then jumped into the water and came down to me and that's, as we were being winched up, oh, I tapped him on the shoulder and uh, the yacht sank. Wow, so you just got him? Just got him in time, yeah. yeah. It was just, there's lots of stories like that. And what did he say when he, he got up? He said, well, he was virtually speechless because they'd been battered around for quite a while and they were absolutely wrecked. A lot of injuries on them. Again, we landed and, and off they went. And then we went back out again Rescuers like David Key just have to keep going. There's no other choice. There's always one rule. Nothing justifies endangering the aircraft. If things go bad, the officer at the end of the line is expendable and will be cut free. He's been the last chance for yachties, boaties, bushwalkers, snowboarders, skiers and surf fishermen trapped by rising tides. Some have been grateful, while others have allowed their anxiety to get the better of them with bushwalkers grabbing him by the legs as he descended, and those caught in the water trying to use him as a floating stepladder, clambering up his legs to try and climb to the rescue cord. He says a good rescuer needs to be a good actor. No matter how you feel, you can't show it. You keep smiling and talking, and don't show any fear. If you're enjoying this podcast, please remember to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. And remember to rate and comment on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Unless, of course, you don't like it, then shut up. Another memorable rescue for Key was during the Black Saturday bushfires. During those fires in February 2009, the police helicopter was reporting to ground units when they received a call from the Channel 9 helicopter about four people caught in King Lake West surrounded by the exploding bush. With homes literally exploding in flames, drastic measures were required to help many people escape their properties. The police air wing was called in to evacuate this family of five near Whittlesea as fire edged closer to their home. It was about 46 degrees that day. It was rather warm. And we got a call from the Channel 9 helicopter. who said, oh, we're at Coombs Road in King Lake. Um, There's a family trapped. Can you come and see if you can rescue them? We said, yeah, no worries. So we went up there, flew over, assessed the situation. The fire was on three sides of the house, coming up the fourth side. And it was about four people, some dogs, cat, um, horses. So it was a bit of a menagerie. I mean, this was a terrible area. But 11 people did yes, die yes. in that very, yes. almost that street. Right, Naylor was just yeah. on the road. Yeah. We could see houses exploding, mainly because of the gas bottles and things like that. And so we went round. Um, just surveyed it, talked about it, and we went, yeah, well, we can try and get some people out uh, before the fire front actually hits the house. As he sat on the edge of the helicopter, about to be wedged into the cauldron, he thought he had next to no chance of saving those below. But he knew he would have to try. Did you think he wanted to die? Yes, basically. You know, just by looking at these, these flames, and, oh, it's incredible, because it was just roaring through. And, because there was a lot of smoke, um, I don't think the people on the ground could see the flames that was behind it. And of course their driveway had been cut off, it was on fire. And the other two sides uh, were on fire. And even the houses behind this one was on fire, so that's how bad it was. So we came down, I got winched out, and um, the lady came up to me. And you can look at people in the eyes, and that's how you can tell what they're like. Uh, and this. They have like a thousand yard stare because they just don't know what to do. And I said, right, come on, let's go. And sort of snapped her out of it. What was her name? That was uh, Juliet Moore. Juliet talked to Nine News about her experience. It was the scariest thing I've ever ever experienced. It was the wind that was the scariest. The trees were just falling around, right down around us. And um, we, we thought that the fire sprinkler system, we thought we'd be okay, but there was a point there where it started coming from two directions and. Um, yeah, I wasn't so sure after that. Grabbed her, put her in the harness, and she said, oh, I'm not leaving without my dog. I said, that's fair enough. Bit of an animal lover, so we got the dog between us. Just at that Remember time, the dog's name? Um, Poncho. But we got hit with a 
gust of wind with a lot of embers in it and it sort of caught her in the hair so she sort of was doing this and because I'm in a helmet, no mix, flight suit, gloves, I could just feel the heat. Um, then the dog, she sort of panicked and the dog panicked so the dog jumped out and she said, oh, I'm not leaving the dog. And I looked up to the helicopter and I got the signal to get off the wire. However, the fire was sucking the air from the helicopter blades, putting it in danger. But what it was, the fire was sort of all around us. It was just taking all the air out, yeah. the oxygen. And the helicopter was sinking. Ah. He was on full power. We've got four and a half tonnes and it's just starting to sink. And even with my extra weight trying to get me up, could have brought the whole machine down on top of me. As per the drill, he was cut loose to save the helicopter. Even though the odds were, he'd die with the others. So they give the cut signal, so I released and let go, and then he swooped down and then took off. So you're in the middle of an inferno mm -hmm. in all your kit, mm -hmm. and they, you see the helicopter head off. Yeah, fly away. That, that'd, be, that'd be good. Yeah, very interesting day. Key stood there with four people, three horses and a dog, with a bushfire of monstrous proportions bearing down on them. He marshalled his team into three cars, one pulling a double horse float with Poncho. So how, how many people have we got? Four. Four people, a dog, and two horses? Three horses. Three horses, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Noah's Ark. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Trees were crashing around them, and they were blinded by the smoke and flames. But the chopper was still flying above them. Leading Senior Constable Brian Norman and Pilot Constable Warwick Young could see what Key couldn't and there was a sliver of a chance. The group could possibly escape using a rough bush track. They directed Key and the group down that track and to the road before the front closed in again. So Channel 9 was, had filmed all this as well. So um, aircrafts, they're talking to each other and I'm talking to air aircraft because I have portable radio. And I said, is there any chance we can get out? And they said, well, you can't go up Coombs Road because it's completely on fire. If you can get through the driveway and go right down a bush track. And I said, uh, well, I've got to give it a go because if we stay here, it's just, um, we're going to finish, get finished. So I said, right up. So I jumped in the car uh, with Juliet and uh, the young, another lass was driving, the fellow was driving the four wheel drive with a horse float, and then there was another car behind. And we took her up the driveway through the fire. You know, it was on fire, but we could get through. So we got through that, turn right, and started to head down. They were guided towards the only opening in the fire front by the hovering air wing and the Channel 9 helicopter. By then, the group had grown. And as we were driving along, I didn't notice this at the time because I'm busy talking to the helicopter. But there, there were deer, kangaroo, wombats, all sorts of animals following us on the road and on the embankment. Juliet told the news what she saw. All those animals that came and joined us, there was yeah. deer and there was a koala and a kangaroo and the lizards. I didn't see it, but later, that's what she told You know, she had to go to the inquiry, mm. bushfire inquiry, and that's what she said. She called it Dave's Ark <laughs> because of all the animals we, we had with us. And horses are normally spooked by smoke and fire and deer. They don't like each other. We had a deer running beside the horse, evidently, and the horse started to catch on fire, so there was a bottle of Pepsi in the back, so I shook the Pepsi up and sprayed the horse, because his mane and his tail and that were on, you know, smouldering, mm -hmm. so I put him out. Although they had a pathway out, they were still in serious danger, because bushfires have a mind of their own. And I said to the, the boys in the helicopter, I said, how are we going? They said, oh, probably a good idea if you'd speed it up a little bit, because <laughs> they could see the fire coming straight towards us. So we increased the speed a little bit and got down to the bottom and there was a clear paddock. So I got the bloke to knock the gate down, moved him into the paddock. I said, change the horses over. If a fire gets to here, burn this area, let it burn, and then you drive into the bird area. I said, it's no use driving down there because of the bushfire completely surround you. David Key left the group there and went on to another rescue. As he led the group to safety, they never knew exactly how close they were to death. Juliet says the first thing he gave them was a belief they could survive. She said he risked his life to come down from the helicopter. We've stayed friends ever since. To some extent, he's my hero. And he's just a nice, normal bloke as well, she told me. 
David Key and the team were recognised with the prestigious Valor Award for the Sydney to Hobart Rescue, but they still had their critics. There was a, a little criticism um, internally, wasn't there, that um, you shouldn't have stayed out there that long and you risked the, the, risked the craft. So it, it took a fair time, but you eventually were presented with a Valor Award? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, again, those people probably have never been put into that situation that we're in. And we were assessing it the whole time. It wasn't just blindly going into it. We were assessing our fuel the whole time. It's just that we are in two cyclones, mm. and no one told us that. David and the team also received international acknowledgement, which gave them the chance to catch up with the man they saved in the Sydney to Hobart, John Campbell. Uh, just returned to our normal duties as we do. Then we got a, uh, a call from um, the US Coast Guard and said, oh, can you three come to Canada for a presentation for the Captain William J. Kostler? And he was a rescue crewman that died during a rescue. And every year they give it to anyone in the world that's done the, I suppose if you call it, the bravest rescue. And we won it that year. So we went over there, um, stayed with the Campbells, uh, which was terrific. And the, the personal side of it is that we we're having dinner at John's house in Seattle, his mum and dad and his brother. And they're all mad adventurers there. <laughs> snowboarders and cross-country skiers and all sorts of things, you know. And his mum said, oh, I'd like to thank you. you we brought John into this world. You brought him back to us. Oh, lovely. You know, so it was, it was a nice personal touch. And we have visited them a couple of times since, and they've been to Australia. So we've got a bit of a, a, bit of a bond. He named his goldfish after him? Yes. One named David, one named Daryl, <laughs> and uh, one named Barry. <laughs> John Campbell also named his daughter Victoria. But even after that, David remains pragmatic about his career. Some of you might think uh, are just everyday rescues, you know, but you still got to make, have that same focus, that same briefing, same preparation, and do things, you know, you do, you've got a job to do. Just doing my job, that's what, that's what I'm trained for. There was, however, a way he told people they could repay him for his help. Sometimes when you rescue people, I say, oh, how can we ever thank you? I say, I like chocolate cake. <laughs> and bugging me dead, you'd be surprised the amount of people that turn up at the air ring with a chocolate cake. <laughs> it's not a bribe, it's no, just no, a gift. No, that's right. David has retired, saying it's a young man's game. You know, I can still do it, uh, but it's, it's a young man's game to do it. The people who rescued will always be grateful. And David will never be short of chocolate cake. Naked City is brought to you by The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Subscriptions power our newsroom. So to support independent journalism, consider subscribing to the Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. This episode is produced and edited by Margaret Machine Gun Gordon and Anu the Axe Hasbold and mixed and mastered by Jellic Knight John Greenfield with technical assistance from Cool Hand Cormac Lally. Tom McKendrick is Head of Audio. Archival is thanks to 9 and 3AW. I'm John Sylvester. Thanks for listening. Next episode is Victoria's first undercover officer, Nick Cecil, and how he nearly called great train robber Ronald Biggs. Um, and I reckon you were probably Victoria's first undercover I was. officer. Yeah. So you go into Intel, and of course one of your big cases is trying to find the great bookie robber. Biggs. Yeah, Ronald Biggs. That was the slightest. Because Big, Biggs was hiding in Melbourne in 67 yes. or then, about. Right?